Hi, I'm Pastor Hunter from Citrus Grove Church, and I'm walking you through the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 34 today. This is the sermon message for our worship service that we always host at Pinecrest Academy, 9.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Uh, so you're invited to that. If you're in town, if you're in the area, uh, come, come along and join us and be wonderful to worship with you in person. Otherwise, I'm glad we have this opportunity too. Uh, so join me here on the, the patio as we look at those passages out of the Bible. We're going to be in Luke 18. Once again, uh, just a few verses, 31 to 34. So uh, let me start by reading those, and then we'll talk about them a little bit. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles, they will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. I wonder if you've heard the phrase, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. Ancient advice probably has some explanation about the, the colors in the sky with barometric pressure or dust in the atmosphere. I don't exactly know why, but I think it holds up, at least enough to become an old sailor saying, as uh, probably as close to a you know, farmer's almanac, a weather forecast, as you could get back in those olden days. All you have to do is just look up in the sky, see what color it is, is it red or not? and let that determine whether you're going to go sailing that day or not. And as technology got smarter and meteorology became <clears throat> more of a science, you know, the, the, through observations of patterns and then more recently computer models, you finally get to a Dennis Phillips or your meteorologist of choice who can pretty much tell you with pretty good certainty how hot or cold or rainy or sunny it will be five days from now. They could guess maybe as far as eight days out, but even they would say, well, that's just a halfway guess. Don't put any weight into what's going to be eight days out. But about four or five days, I can tell you pretty close to certain. That's it. Five days, maybe a few more. Beyond that, our models are just guessing. And the smartest weather people will say, I, I'm not even going to pretend to know what weather will be like two weeks from now. Yet, Three times now in the Gospel of Luke, we're in chapter 18 now, this is the third time, three times Jesus has predicted what would happen not just weeks, but months, and even uh, years, it seems, in the future. And each time he says it as a red sky morning. Uh, his disciples need to listen to him and take warning. Here is... Uh, something confusing about it that Jesus didn't just say that he had a suspicion some sense a bad feeling a tingling about what is gonna happen out in the future instead in a series of eight future action words this will happen this will happen this will happen this will happen he tells them precisely how it's gonna go down notice that he does take the twelve disciples aside including the one named Judas, who would be the fulfillment of one of those words in this, in this passage, that he was going to be the one who will betray him. But he took them to the side to get their full attention and, and start prepping them seriously for that dark night when they would flee, flee away to safety. And their teacher would be falsely accused and then executed, and they would hole up in this locked house waiting for the other shoe to drop. He wanted them to know, to have these words in their memory, even if they didn't get them at the time. At least hear this directly from me. Although even though he, he took them to the side to tell them this, Jesus wasn't guarding some big mystery here. There's no secret plan, except to just go through with, <coughs> with everything that the prophets had been publicly saying that the Messiah would have to suffer. And they've been saying that to anyone who would listen for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's no secret plan here. This is the plan. 
read your Old Testament of the Bible, read what the prophet said the Messiah would have to go through to bring peace to his people, that's what will happen to me. Well, I'm going to say something obvious now, so forgive me, but the, the advice about red sky at morning, that's supposed to keep sailors safe. Duh. You know, don't go out. Don't get stuck in a storm. And same for modern meteorologists. You don't just listen to them just as entertainment, maybe a little bit, but uh, the reason that you listen to your meteorologist or check your forecast isn't just to get more information in your head. It's so that you know whether to pack sunscreen or an umbrella or maybe to avoid going outside altogether or maybe if you have to evacuate, then you do it to stay safe and you have some time to spare before the storm hits. Those predictions are never just FYI for your information. They're FYH they're for your health. So you'd think what Jesus' disciples thought was if Jesus knows that mockings and insults <clears throat> and spitting and flogging and death are all out there on the horizon, if that's what's in the forecast, even, even more specifically, that those sufferings are all waiting to pounce on him in a specific city that he knows about at a specific time that he apparently can tell. Um, it's going to be the upcoming next holiday, the Passover. Well, then don't just sit on that information. <laughs> Act on it, shouldn't he? Avoid the trouble. Maybe that's why they didn't get it. it. If you know this, Jesus, just avoid it. Stay out of trouble. Avoid the pain. Avoid dying. Why are we still walking this direction if you know what is coming up right over there? They couldn't understand that. The answer is because back in <clears throat> Luke 9, verse 21, when Jesus told the group all about this for the first time, predicting his death the first time in the Gospel of Luke, he started by saying, here's what must happen. Meaning this is the plan God designed and revealed bit by bit through his prophets, and finally, it's happening. It has to happen. You know, back then... In chapter 9 of Luke, Jesus is saying it must happen, so start getting yourselves ready. Now, here in chapter 18, he's saying it's about to happen, so really get yourselves ready. He's not planning to avoid any of it, so just put that thought out of your mind. He's not, he's not going to avoid it. Uh, he's, he's, is he looking forward to it? I mean, in one sense, he is looking forward into the future, and... He knows this is what will happen. But his, his prayer and his anguish as it gets closer and closer proves he's not crazy. He doesn't enjoy the pain. He's not sadistic. He, he would love to avoid the pain and escape to survive with his life, except, except for his dedication. Dedication to the only plan that God, his Father, could think of to save his sin-filled world. The Son, God the Son, is totally dedicated to that plan, so he's going to see it through. It must happen. Jesus' beautiful, pure, perfectly healthy heart, it was more dedicated to healing you than it was to sparing himself some pain. The miracle that we're marveling at is not just that Jesus knows what will happen next, which is a miracle. And sometimes it was a, a miracle he chose not to do. Sometimes he, he chose not to use that, that power and exercise it. He, he would choose not to know. He could lay down and pick up his divine abilities as he wished. So he chose to ride in a boat rather than walk on water most of the time. He willfully gave up the use of some of his power for a time. But very interestingly, this plan and the pain that lay up ahead on the horizon was not one of the things that Jesus gave up knowing. He knew about it. He wanted to know that that lay on the horizon, that that was the prize he was aiming for. We don't know much about Jesus' childhood, but maybe, probably, he pieced it together in Sunday school as he, as he heard what his mom and, 
and, and adoptive father Joseph said to, to him about how he was born, about the angels and the wise men, as he learned about what the prophets were predicting and about the, the, the sacrifices offered at the temple of animals, and that all those foreshadowed the offering of a Messiah, offering his own body and blood. One day, this Messiah would atone for people who are filthy, and they would make these people stand pure in God's presence. And probably, Jesus started to pick up, that's my job. That's what I am going to do. I will save all these people, but it will cost me my life. What's clear by this point is Jesus was fully aware of what he was walking toward. What he was walking around on earth for in the first place. He knew his purpose. He looked ahead and sought and considered it as the prize worth heading toward, the, the prize of his life to accomplish that. But before you say, wow, what a burden on Jesus, what a burden to, to know for years that you will die in this brutal way, Jesus didn't just keep that burden on himself. Obviously, what he's doing here in Luke 18, 31 to 34 is, is telling other people about it. He wanted his friends, his, his students, to carry that burden with him and accompany him right up to it and to not be surprised when it happened, but to know exactly what would happen next and to consider this the goal of his life. If only those disciples had if only they had considered it all those things. Verse 34 is, <coughs> is pretty pathetic. They didn't understand it. They couldn't figure out what Jesus was saying. They didn't know what he was talking about. How many ways can you say it? They didn't get it. The words of Jesus' prediction here, they're straightforward enough. They're common words. It can't be that they didn't get the words. They just didn't understand that all of this really could happen. Not to their teacher, Spitting on him? Flogging him? Mock an insult? Well, maybe. But they cannot picture their 33-year-old miracle-working preacher getting killed. Certainly not anytime soon. Not by their own people. So when do you think it started to sink in for those disciples? Maybe in the Garden of Gethsemane as soldiers arrested him and they ran away? Maybe in the halls of Injustice, as religious and secular authorities all condemned him to. As his arms were stretched out and nailed, stuck. And Jesus pulled himself up to breathe and then to shout one last time. Did it sink in then what Jesus was saying here and they got it? Or after all that was done and Jesus' heart beat no more and the now eleven disciples sat in darkness and silence and thought back on how everything could have possibly gone so wrong so suddenly. Then did they realize Jesus told us this would happen? Maybe even then they didn't get it. Maybe we wouldn't have either. Maybe what it took was for Jesus to fulfill the last part of his prediction. We haven't talked about that much yet. Verse 33 says, though, on the third day, he, talking about himself, will rise again. Because if that happens, well, it kind of undoes the damage from the insults and the mocking and the flogging. Once Jesus rises, being killed isn't the end of his story. So it's kind of not as bad if you can see that part too, if you know that he will rise again. Suppose if you fear that blank space on your tombstone where the date will someday go. If you fear it, it's because you don't want to think ahead to that date that day when life as you're used to it will stop. But if we know that we're going to go right on living after that day, well, then maybe I can bring myself to look up, look ahead, stare right at that future day and not be terrified of it. Jesus included that bit in there. On the third day, he will rise again. He included that because it certainly helped him go through his sufferings and death, knowing he would rise again. He, he knew about this all along. In John 10, he said, 
I lay down my life, and I take it back up of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. You know, maybe you can watch those future days coming. Days that make anybody nervous because of our uncertainty and our discomfort. Day maybe when you're mocked by people who disagree with what you believe. You might see that day coming. Just brace yourself for it. Or a day when you might have to choose between suffering some pain or following Jesus. That day could come. Brace yourself for it. Or how about a day when your body is all worn out and gives one last breath? Are those days all out on the horizon? Well, that, that last one is, for sure. So will you ignore it? Ignore the entire horizon by just keeping your eyes down on fun stuff happening now? You could. Or could you be like the Little League baseball player who finally gets why his coach keeps repeating, keep your eye on the ball. It doesn't make it scarier to open your eyes and see that the ball is coming. Instead, it makes you fully aware of where that ball is. Then you don't have to stand there shaking nervously, swatting blindly away. Instead, you don't have to hope think that maybe I'm doing something right, but I have no idea. Instead, you know what's happening right there in those crucial moments. You knew this was coming all along. You've been preparing for it. Your eyes have been on the prize. You, 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 you can keep your eyes on the prize for which Jesus calls you, calls you to heaven. The prize that Jesus won and now just gives you as, as though you had won it, but but it's really a gift. You can thank Jesus for suffering hell so that you won't have to. You don't have to be afraid of what happens after that day you die. You can thank Jesus for dying and rising so that you too will live even after you die. That's what Jesus put on your horizon. Keep your eyes on that prize. Amen. And the peace of God passes our understanding. May it guard your heart in your mind through faith in Christ Jesus. We pray. Almighty Lord Jesus, you saw what was coming and you ran toward it with courage and heroism, bravery. Uh, we don't have words to express the kind of sacrifice you made for us. So all we can do is offer you our lives, our, our praise, our thanksgiving. It's all yours. Everything we have, we dedicate to you. Allow us to have a similar kind of, of, of experience where we see what you put on our horizon. We see the obstacles in the way, but we listen to your voice calling us heavenward. And so we pray in your name. Amen. Take care. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.